Good afternoon and welcome to the second event of the IIEA's Global Europe Project, which is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. This project seeks to address, analyze and communicate to a wider public issues relating to the EU's global role and also to Ireland's engagement with multilateral issues, especially in the context of Ireland's forthcoming membership of the UN Security Council, which begins on the 1st of January 2021 for a two year term. We are very, very lucky today to have as our speaker, the UN High Representative and Under Secretary General for Disarmament Affairs, Izumi Nakamitsu. Let me first of all, take care of a few housekeeping issues. The High Commissioner will address us for 20 minutes and this will be followed by a question and answer session. Both the presentation and the Q&A are on the record. We would encourage you to use the button on your screen to send in questions and we'll take them up then during the presentation. You might also indicate um, which organization that you represent or are a member of when you put in a question. You might also uh, like to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at uh, IIEA. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce the High Commissioner. Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu assumed her position as High Commissioner, as, as High Representative and Under Secretary General on the 1st of May 2017. And in that capacity, she has already addressed the IIEA. I think it was in June 2019. She's had an extensive career, both within the UN system and outside the UN system. She has worked in the UNDP and also in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations at the UN in New York. We look very much forward to hearing what you have to say and to hearing your assessment of what is the state of global multilateral disarmament efforts. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mary, for that introduction. Um, indeed, I was there um, in 2019. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a genuine pleasure to be invited to speak today. Um, I know, because I was there, the IIEA epitomizes a proud Irish tradition of active engagement with the cutting edge issues of foreign policy. I am also particularly grateful for the opportunity to participate in this project, which seeks to uh, navigate the jack rocks of our increasingly complex international environment. From the um, eponymous, the Irish res resolution, the famous one that led to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, to its central role in negotiating the Treaty on the Prohibition of nuclear weapons. Ireland has always been an outspoken advocate for nuclear disarmament and also a very good friend to the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs. Ireland remains an exemplar of how a so-called middle power can advance its ideas and goals in the international system. I remain especially grateful for its leadership to achieve gender equality also in international security diplomacy. And this is not only the right thing to do, uh, but as you know, it's also the smart thing to do. Peace processes involving women are demonstrably more successful. Ireland's principled approach to diplomacy and its willingness to work with others will serve it well on the Security Council next year and I look forward to our collaboration there as well. I have been asked to speak today about the disarmament regime in the context of the ongoing COVID crisis and the prospects for multilateral nuclear disarmament in the coming years. Such reflection is timely as 2020 has been a year of milestones. Since their twin birth, if you will, uh, three quarters of a century ago, nuclear weapons and the United Nations have represented both the perils and the promise of international security that arose out of the ashes of the Second World War. With its entry into force 50 years ago, the MPT heralded that uh, the creation of the current nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament regime. Consequently, 
this year has been an opportune moment to reflect on how far we've come in the pursuit of the elimination of nuclear weapons, but also obviously how much further we have to go. In surveying the current landscape, I am reminded of the words of uh, former Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld. Nuclear re uh, disarmament remains what he called a hardy perennial at the UN. That is to say, despite some good progress, we are still living with unacceptable nuclear risks. Broadly speaking, a nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime is comprised of plurilateral, bilateral, even unilateral uh, elements. But it is the multilateral agreements that give the regime its backbone. Unfortunately, the regime and in particular, its multilateral elements are coming under increasing strain. As the world shifts to an increasingly multipolar polar order, the international security environment is characterized by a complex combination of at least the following uh, phenomena. Corrosive relationships between nuclear um, power, lack of leadership from the great powers, coupled with no genuine efforts or even attempts to understand legitimate security concerns of each other, historic levels of military spending, the emergence of disruptive technologies and potential new domains of conflict, and the uh, growing threat to civilians from increasingly powerful weapons, and of course the entrenchment of regional conflicts with, with nuclear overtones. We are suffering from what Secretary General Guterres has called a trust deficit disorder. That is the steady erosion of trust between not only um, states, but also between governments and their peoples. This has precipitated a broader crisis in multilateralism. It has fed political trends towards uh, populism and exclusionism given rise to inward looking unilateralist uh, and nationalist foreign policies, eroding multilateral institutions. Specific to the topic today, the UN disarmament machinery is paralyzed. The global arms control regimes hangs by a threat. The Security Council is increasingly dysfunctional, stymied with preventing um, the time in preventing the potential erosion of global norms. In parallel, all nuclear armed states are engaged in what has been termed a qualitative nuclear arms race based on the speed, accuracy, and stealth of the weapons. Belligerent rhetoric is on the rise, coupled with return of outmoded concepts such as nuclear war fighting and uh, the more uh, prominent role accorded to nuclear weapons in security doctrines. The nexus between emerging technologies and nuclear weapons has exposed new vulnerabilities and heightened prospects of miscommunication and miscalculation. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated this strain and uh, catalyzed several of the negative security trends that have been brewing for some time, most obviously the deteriorating relations between major armed powers. The pandemic should have also taught us several lessons, not least that seemingly low probability threats uh, can occur with catastrophic global consequences and for the urgent need to prevent such, such a situation when it comes to nuclear weapons. Given the collective objective of preventing the use of nuclear weapons and achieving their elimination, I do believe that the opportunity to course correct exists. 2020 has been a year of milestones, but the next 12 months is also full of symbolic and practical occasions to grant the current uh, nuclear uh, dangers and get back to the path to the elimination of nuclear weapons. 
For example, early in the new year, we will commemorate the 75th anniversary of the very first resolution of the General Assembly, which in Tuvalia called for the means to eliminate atomic weapons. All states should use this milestone to reaffirm their commitment to the norm against nuclear use, to nuclear disarmament, and to the obligations they have undertaken to achieve that goal. By the end of February, the new START treaty will hopefully have been extended. I encourage the United States and the Russian Federation to use the moment to commit to negotiations on further reductions in the world's largest nuclear arsenals. 29th of August is the 30th anniversary of the closure of the Semipalatinsk nuclear test site. International Day Against Nuclear Test, commemorated on that day, is the perfect occasion to show up the norm against nuclear testing through the reaffirmation of unilateral moratoriums and renewed push to bring the CTBT into force. Later next year, states parties to the TPNW will hold their first meeting of states parties. The TPNW's entry into force is evidence of many states' concern at the nuclear weapons status quo. It is a strong demonstration of support for multilateral approaches to nuclear disarmament. Finally, next August is expected to see the convening of the twice postponed 10th MPT review conference. The review conference will be a locus for all the challenges facing the regime as a whole. Divisions amongst nuclear weapons, differences over the pace and scale of disarmament, regional proliferation crisis, and the need to strengthen the safeguards regime. I am confident that despite divergences, states parties continue to prize the tan tangible uh, security benefits the MPT provides and will therefore endeavor to find a way to common ground and a successful outcome. It is worth remembering that no successful review conference outcome has been identical. It is in the hands of states parties as to what any outcomes may look like. I also believe uh, there are several key steps the review conference can take to strengthen the norms against nuclear use and kickstart new efforts on disarmament. First, a reaffirmation of support to the treaty and to all commitments and obligations undertaken, including to the total elimination of nuclear arsenals. Second, a recommitment to the norm against the use of nuclear weapons. We should return to the logic of President Reagan and General Secretary Gorbachev. A nuclear war cannot be won, must not be fought. Third, the, the nuclear weapon states should agree on a package of practical risk reduction measures to lessen the potential for miscalculation or accident. Fourth, a commitment to strengthen the non-proliferation regime. Challenges to the safeguard system are evolving and so the system must evolve too. Fifth, the review conference can be a springboard for thinking about what Secretary General Guterres has described as a new vision for disarmament how to build on the great gains made to date, but also address the realities of the present. I want to expound on this last point and because obviously uh, it goes beyond the review conference and speaks to the entire future of disarmament. Various factors I outlined earlier um, but especially the evolution of the multipolarity in the context of technolog technological advancements mean that the world is a very different place than it was even 10 years ago. The fluid uh, context requires new ways of thinking when it comes to the elimination of WMD 
and the regulation of conventional weapons. The pandemic has only underscored this need to adapt. Any new approach or thinking should include at least dialogue about <clears throat> how to include all nuclear weapons in negotiations, how to include other nuclear armed states in the arms control processes, how to address the long overdue issue of controls on missiles, how to prevent the deployment of particularly this, this, uh, destabilizing weapon systems, what new transparency and confidence building measures are required and how to make emerging technologies work for us to create a safer and more secure world in areas such as verification and safeguards. The new thinking must also be um, broader than the technical issues. <clears throat> Let me suggest the three fundamental approaches I believe are critical in our collective new thinking. To begin with, a shift in focus is required uh, to approach that places humans at the center of security, one that is firmly anchored in prevention and mediation. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, armed conflicts continue to rage in many parts of the world. In March, as you know, Secretary General Guterres called for an immediate global ceasefire so aid workers could reach people in areas affected by conflict. And while 170 states, several regional organizations, 200 civil society groups, and more than a dozen non-state armed groups have publicly endorsed this call, rhetorical commitments has not really translated into action. Fragile healthcare systems have been further crippled by the use of heavy explosive weapons, hindering in, uh, emergency response to the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, underscoring the need to prevent the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. I congratulate Ireland for initiating the informal consultative process in Geneva on the political declaration and reiterate the UN's continued support to efforts to address this issue. A human-centered approach must also seek to foster new cooperation, partnerships, and uh, inclusivity. The Secretary General's agenda for disarmament places a firm emphasis on the principle of cooperation and partnership to ensure a diversity of voices from civil society to women to youth. This means deepening the linkages between disarmament and the youth and women peace and security agendas and their respective communities to accelerate progress across all. On women's participation, we need to push for parity in delegations and for women to be actively engaged in disarmament and arms control efforts. At the same time, understanding of gendered impacts of arms flows and associated challenges should inform the design of adequate responses in all policy and decision-making frameworks. UNODA's contribution to gender equality and gender mainstreaming includes, among others, flagship projects funded by the European Union in support of gender mainstream, mainstream policies, programs, and actions in the fight against small arms trafficking and misuse in line with the women, peace and security agenda. Secondly, the pandemic has underscored the need for a strengthened and renewed multilateralism. We must send a clear message explaining the historical success of multilateralism and why cooperation is needed now more than ever. Few issues reflect this need more than nuclear disarmament. After all, any use of nuclear weapons would likely have global ramifications. Therefore, the entire international community has a responsibility to prevent it. The UN disarmament machinery needs to be reinforced and refurbished. In short, it needs to get back to work 
by focusing on priority issues. The dysfunction in the Security Council is proof of a need for creating middle power diplomacy. In recent years, non-permanent members have endeavored to keep the existential issue of nuclear weapons on the Council's agenda, and I hope this will remain the case. As the arbiter of international peace and security, it is the responsibility of the Council to prevent the erosion of norms against the use of WMDs and a human carnage caused by weapons uh, in conflict. This will require deft diplomacy and commitment from all Council members. Accelerated progress in disarmament in the 21st century will require not only instruments such as treaties, but agreements and arrangements such as political declarations and voluntary codes of conduct, especially to address the versioning impact of rapid technological change on international security. This requires, requires new creative multilateral diplomacy based on the contributions of more inclusive multi-stakeholder processes, as well as traditional multilateral negotiations. Doug Hamschold was a wise man. He understood that disarmament could not be viewed in a vacuum, that it was instrument, instrumental in creating peaceful solutions. As I have said time and again, arms control and disarmament are not utopian ideals. History shows that they are useful, effective, and indeed indispensable instruments for security. This is my final point. More reflection needs to be undertaken on how to better integrate disarmament processes into broader peace and security processes. What I have outlined today is only a snapshot of the steps needed to reorient the world away from nuclear dangers and back towards nuclear elimination. But the many opportunities to make progress that arise uh, in the coming months can only be taken advantage of if states show the necessary political will and initiative. I am sure we can count on Ireland in this regard, and I look forward to working with Ireland in pursuing a shared goal of a safer and more secure world. I thank you very much for listening and for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the exchanges. Back to you, Mary. Hello. Uh, I think you can hear me now. Thank you very much for that very substantive statement. It was amazing in the sense that it was uh, both sober and ambitious and very, very practical as to what could be done, but very realistic at the same time. Your ambitions for the MPT on one level are not great, but in the current environment, they are enormous. And we wish you and, and Ireland will work very closely, closely with you on that. Could I ask you on that issue of, of the MPT, um, how do you evaluate the possibility of um, keeping alive the joint comprehensive plan of action with Iran? It is very much relevant, I think, to the future uh, of the MPT and relevant to international uh, cooperation on the issue of dealing with nuclear <laughs> threat. Should we be hopeful? Um. Indeed, I, I hope we, we can be hopeful. Um, as you know, um, we and, and also the Secretary General has consistently stated um, that, um, you know, we would like to try and protect JCPOA and remaining states, um, you know, will be able to remain uh, in that agreement. Um, he expressed disappointment in the, uh, the, the by, uh, you know, for the decision that had been taken uh, by uh, the United States. Um, and, and also he has repeatedly uh, called um, for, for Iran 
to return to full commitment um, to, um, to all the, um, the, the provisions um, and performing its nuclear related uh, commitments. Um, now, um, President-elect Biden uh, has stated his uh, um, uh, readiness to return um, if Iran returns to full commitment. Um, so, um, so there is at least that um, possibility, and I think it is very, very important for the entire community. Uh, of course, as you say, it's also important for the, the success for the NPT review conference, but I think it is uh, quite important for the region. Uh, it was indeed one of the, the if you will, um, um, positive outcome um, of uh, disarmament and non-proliferation uh, through negotiation and diplomacy. Um, and so it will be important on, on several different levels. And we hope therefore um, that Iran uh, will uh, stop uh, destabilized actions and return to full commitment. And with uh, the new administration uh, coming up, um, will be able to uh, return to um, 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 the JCPOA uh, commitments as a, as a whole. Um, so let us hope um, and let us work on um, those issues uh, as we approach um, MPT uh, review conference now, as you know, uh, rescheduled again uh, for the, the month of August. Um, so let us hope. Yes, definitely. Uh, the question here um, in relating uh, from Claude Quain relating to an address that we had uh, at the Institute last year from the uh, executive director of ICANN, uh, who spoke particularly on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Now, I understand that is coming into force in January. Um, how do you see that contributing uh, to bringing this issue forward, the debate forward, and how can it contribute to the review conference? Yes, um, TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, will uh, enter into force on 22nd of January uh, 2021, next year. So um, it's um, um, almost a month. Um, as we have said many times, when it enters into force, it will be a, a new killer of a nuclear disarmament regime. Now, I don't need to explain to this crowd um, or audience that uh, disarmament regime, nuclear disarmament regime in particular, um, is actually a web of various instruments, uh, as I mentioned, uh, multilateral uh, agreements and treaties um, of uh, different kinds, but also they are regional level arrangements and agreements creating nuclear weapon free zones around the world. Uh, they are bilateral agreements, treaties, and, and policy and political commitments by uh, a, a range of uh, countries, in particular nuclear and weapon states. Um, so, um, you know, collectively this uh, regime functions, and uh, they will now be a new um, uh, pillar uh, added to that regime. Uh, there are a couple of things that is important. Uh, we think it is a welcome development that uh, a norm against nuclear weapons uh, will be um, uh, again strengthened. Uh, it will be uh, binding on states, parties and ratifying states. Uh, but uh, as uh, time goes, um, there will be a renewed awareness uh, that nuclear weapons really should not be used first and foremost, but also should not exist. Uh, so generally speaking, strengthening the norm against nuclear weapons uh, is a contribution um, that uh, this new TPNW will, uh, will, will, will make. Um, now, in the context of NPTs or in relations to NPTs in particular, um, you know, Ireland and other uh, core groups, core countries that negotiated or that led the negotiation of the TPNW uh, repeatedly said that it is um, something, it is a, a treaty that will complement and reinforce NPT, uh, in particular, the Article 6 uh, uh, obligations. Um, so um, we are very much looking forward to supporting TPNW ratifying states uh, in the context of their um, um, conference on states parties, meeting of states parties, to uh, start uh, um, 
looking at and, and start discussing the develop, further developments of this new treaty uh, that will work in harmony with and in compact, compact, um, uh, complementary with uh, the NPT. Um, there are very strong views, as you know, uh, expressed from uh, some of the um, uh, NPT states parties and, and um, other uh, UN um, member states in general. Uh, against this uh, TPNW, um, our advice has always been um, that uh, let us uh, try to make sure that the two treaties will work uh, in complementarity with each other and, and do not uh, uh, create a situation where these two treaties uh, will exist in contradiction uh, with each other. Um, that devise uh, different groups, different countries um, in the context of a review conference. And um, I believe it is entirely uh, possible. What we need to do is to find, if you will, modus vivendi uh, between those uh, different, uh, different groups. Um, and um, I know that many uh, uh, efforts are being taken um, to that end. And, and some of the countries that have um, uh, said that they would like to try to be a, a bridge builder uh, to that end uh, are very actively working on this and I, I, I am very, very uh, grateful for those efforts and I think it is entirely possible. Thank you. There's a question here from Orla Fitzmaurice, who's the Director for Disarmament and Nonproliferation in the Department of Foreign Affairs here in Dublin. She says, many thanks for the excellent thought-provoking presentation. Um, she refers to the fact that you spoke about the need for the nuclear weapon states to agree a risk reduction package as part of the NPT review conference. Could you say some more about what you see as the most promising possible elements in such a package? What would be the most challenging dimensions and how can non-nuclear weapon states ensure that the level of ambition is sufficient? Yes, that's a, a very... Um important question, it's a very difficult question. Um, first of all, I do understand that, um, you know, even with the difficulties uh, that we have seen in recent years, in particular <clears throat> last year and this year, um, the P5 or N5 in this context, in the nuclear weapon states, uh, in the context of NPTs, um, they have continued <clears throat> the, um, uh, the P5 gatherings and discussions. And in that context, um, I understand that they have uh, also um, brought up um, the issues of, uh, you know, risk, redu risk reduction related matters. Uh, for example, um, you know, um, what are the doctrines that they, they have? Uh, what are the possible uh, further uh, transparency measures uh, that they could have? And I think uh, these efforts, uh, even though um, they all say separately that in five countries, they all uh, report um, to, to us that it's been a very difficult conversations. Uh, those conversations have continued and um, it is uh, continued and it will continue uh, further all the way up to, to August. Um, and um, with the um, um, stated um, um, policy of the president-elect uh, in the United States. Um, once a new START uh, treaty, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, will have been uh, extended <clears throat> uh, soon. Um, I think, um, hopefully, I hope, uh, there they will be a better atmosphere conducive to um, making progress on, on some of those issues uh, related to uh, risk reductions. Um, and um, of course, um, non-nuclear weapon states um, can uh, definitely contribute. Uh, I think there have been quite a lot of uh, uh, very uh, active uh, discussions and conversations taking place. Um, and I know Ireland also has been uh, deeply involved in those conversations um, on what might be, uh, in fact, a new, um, um, you know, in the context of a, a, a new, um, international security environments that we spoke of, uh, what, you know, what are the types of uh, um, um, risk reduction measures, uh, communication um, um, uh, methods, communication channels that existed during the, the previous Cold War that can be updated uh, to fit to a new context. Um, and um, 
uh, I think, um, um, you know, this is something that um, between nuclear weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states, and, and also even um, the, um, the members of the TPNW um, uh, can um, uh, find a common ground. Uh, we, you know, this is, uh, this is one of the reasons why we think this, it will be, um, it will form uh, a part of a, a likely uh, successful outcome. Um, and, um, and risk reduction measures from that point of view uh, will be a, a very positive contribution um, uh, for all this uh, review conference. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm very uh, struck by how practical but ambitious you are as well at the same time. Um, there's a question from Hiroaki Nakanishi. And he asked, this is a perennial problem, I think, in the disarmament side. How can the United Nations bridge the gap between the nuclear weapon states, the non-nuclear weapon states, and civil society, specifically encouraging and facilitating dialogues on issues? Um, the UN, um, we hope um, uh, we are still regarded as an impartial uh, um, uh, actor here. Um, we don't, um, you know, lean towards, um, you know, particular positions, uh, except that we protect and defend um, the, um, the shared common objective of uh, making progress towards the, um, the nuclear free world. Um, and, um, and there are actually quite a lot of um, um, activities that we undertake. Uh, from, for example, behind the scene, uh, passing of messages, um, speaking bilaterally to uh, various governments uh, and, and try to um, better understand uh, where they are coming from. Um, I mentioned uh, in my remarks that there, is, there seem to be a, a really shortage of uh, genuine efforts to understand um, each other's legitimate security concerns. Um, now, it is difficult because, because it is sensitive, it's national security, etc. Uh, but um, understanding security concerns um, that is, um, you know, um, in, in our view, will be the first step towards um, a real genuine dialogue. So we facilitate analysis, um, which is impartial and objective. Um, we uh, provide um, those analyses uh, so that it can be utilized uh, in their conversations as well. We reach out to various countries um, as a group or bilaterally uh, to make sure that, um, you know, their conversations with each other uh, will be done in a sincere and, and, and civilized manner. And then we try to also provide um, expertise, substantive ex expertise uh, in all of those uh, um, efforts. And finally, of course, uh, we are a, a platform. Um, you know, I think um, something like uh, national security, hardcore national security, uh, some of the aspects will obviously have to be negotiated in bilateral context between concerned states. Uh, but at the same time, um, at the multilateral level, we provide um, a secure environment uh, where um, those countries can come and discuss their matters of concern and try to find a common ground. And we help those countries to try to find a common ground. So um, the, the role that we play as the United Nations um, is, uh, you know, um, a difficult one in the current uh, context um, as a um, convener, uh, as a facilitator. And if I may add one more, uh, which I am also very keen, uh, we would like to strive to become one, uh, is a, a, a thought leader, uh, together with um, some of the, the you know, uh, the world's uh, great thinkers, member states and, and um, uh, think tanks like, like, like yours, uh, civil society actors, uh, we uh, try to generate uh, new perspectives and, and, and new um, um, approaches. Uh, in the, um, you know, in the hope that uh, these uh, new thinkings will contribute uh, to 
a creation of a new vision at the international level. So we play di slightly different uh, roles and, and all of them are very difficult ones. Uh, but uh, finally, what I need to say is that the United Nations is an instrument created by its member states. And we would like to be a useful and uh, effective uh, instrument uh, in, in the service of um, what we all uh, strive to, to achieve uh, that are enshrined in the UN Charter. Thank you for thank you very much for that answer. Um, two questions that that, that um, have now come up. One from Francis Collins, the deputy director at the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, who asks why, in your view, is there such reluctance by some states to recommit to past obligations under the NPT, and how can countries like Ireland ensure that we do not end up with an outcome of the lowest common denominator at the Revcon? That's the first question. And the second question, another subject very near our hearts and yours, uh, women, peace and security. You did speak about that in your presentation. What are the main challenges now to, to the full implementation of this uh, Security Council resolution? Um, there's been a lot of talk about mainstreaming the issue. Why is it taking so long? Okay, um, so um, the first question, uh, why uh, reluctance uh, to uh, past commitments? Um, I mean, they, they say very openly, uh, why? Because the, the security environment has changed dramatically. Um, you know, the, the world that we, we are in now are different from the time that, the, you know, those commitments were made. Um, and um, and so you know a lot of uh, many countries are looking at the uh, the changes in the international security environment um, and uh, are starting from there uh, and therefore looking at the, the previous commitments um, that is something um, that would not serve their um, security but uh, the other way around. Um, so the arguments that we make, uh, is that no, in fact, those uh, agreements and commitments, um, um, you know, norms, um, uh, etc., uh, they are actually um, uh, very important to, you know, try to make sure that the security environment would not further deteriorate. Um, and, and so, um, you know, for us, uh, it is an important part of um, the norms that we have collectively created. Um, as I said, it's a combination of a, you know, a gamut of various different types of arrangements that we have in nuclear disarmament regime. And uh, past commitments um, is one of uh, uh, important elements of, of, of such uh, um, uh, package. And, and so we hope that um, um, countries will return to, um, um, you know, commitments, um, reaffirm their commitments and, and try to, in fact, create um, um, an uh, environment that is conducive to talking about, okay, so the context, the environment have changed, what else do we need to do? What are the new things that we need to do to, um, uh, you know, to look at the reality and, and tackle the reality of the security environment rather than um, you know, um, sort of demolishing and, and forgetting and, 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 and you know, uh, going um, away from um, the norms and the commitments that have made before. Um, so let us hope that that could be done at the um, uh, review conference uh, and, and we will definitely work with countries like uh, Ireland. What can you do? Um, I think it is, um, they, they are um, um, majority of countries uh, that speak to the importance of um, past commitments. Um, and, uh, and therefore, I think those voices uh, consistently uh, heard uh, in diplomacy uh, definitely is a very important uh, reminder um, to, um, to all of us. And, and so, um, you know, we would very much like to, to work with you uh, in that regard. Um, women, peace and security agenda, um, why is it has it been so slow? Um, that's a good question. I think um, it is um, probably a combination of various answers. 
um, one. Um, it's, um, you know, unfortunately, they are a different, um, um, you know, uh, status of progress um, in, you know, looking at different parts of the world. Um, and um, um, I would also need to say that uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic uh, has uh, set this issue related to, uh, for example, violence against women, uh, set us back um, uh, in the reverse direction. Um, so they are still a long way to go. Um, the good news is that um, there are now uh, clear data um, that uh, this is not just the right thing to do, but it is an, uh, you know, uh, important operational necessity, as, as the Secretary uh, General say, it's a smart thing to do. Um, so if we want to achieve a sustainable development, if we want to you know, sustain peace, if we want to resolve uh, conflicts, uh, all of those objectives, I hope um, the international community shares uh, very strongly, if that is the case, then uh, achieving um, women, peace and security agenda will help uh, achieve that overall uh, objective. So I think we need to continue to um, emphasize that smart thing to do uh, part of it. Uh, and of course, we need, you know, when, when we are tackling with those issues, uh, setting of a very concrete uh, uh, numerical, in many instances, targets and objectives, creating uh, um, a clear implementation framework uh, together with um, um, monitoring mechanisms and, and, and evaluation mechanisms. Um, in other words, uh, to be driven by the, the data on progress, etc., and consistently uh, adjusting uh, policy frameworks uh, to, to making sure that the progress will, will not slow. Um, I think uh, those are the efforts that we need to take all simultaneously. Um, this is one of those uh, priority agenda for myself, but also for the entire UN system. Uh, and it is um, um, encouraging uh, that many uh, member states actually come around this uh, WPS uh, agenda and, and continuously um, um, helping us to implement this. Thank you for that. Um, two more questions. I'm trying to get in as many as possible uh, because I know our time is running out. Um, the first one is from Peter Gunning, who is a member of the IIEA, and he asks for your views on the extent that China may engage in disarmament discussions. Is it more likely to do so in a UN framework or in an expanded US-Russia-China framework? And the second question is from Pamela Moraga from the Permanent Mission of Chile to the UN office in Geneva. And she uh, thanks you for your presentation. And she asks uh, about the MPT and the Middle East. Uh, the UN convened a conference in this regard and was, it was considered successful. Uh, nevertheless, for some countries from that region, this conference does not exclude the responsibilities imposed in the 1995 resolution. What are your views on this um, and how can it be handled in a manner that it does not impact um, on the review conference in too negative a manner? Mm. <clears throat> yes, thank you for these questions. Uh, again, very important but difficult ones. Uh, let me first uh, um, tackle the first question related to China. Um, you know, we our, our position, our messages have been uh, actually quite clear on on, on this. Uh, number one, um, you know, in view of the fact that. Um, still some 90% of nuclear arsenals belong to the two uh, nuclear, nuclear superpowers, that is the, the United States and the Russian Federation. Um, we ask uh, the two countries to uh, engage and, and extend New START Treaty, which is very, very important, not just for the two countries, but it's for the entire uh, world uh, security. Um, and. Um, uh, however, we did say that, um, and, and I, I hope you noticed uh, in my remarks, um, going forward, we think it will be really important to explore 
um, you know, the ways to include all nuclear weapons, um, not just strategic weapons, strategic nuclear arsenals, um, you know, uh, all kinds of nuclear weapons, and also um, all kinds of nuclear um, uh, weapon states uh, to be, uh, you know, um, involved in armed, armed control, arms control uh, negotiation processes. Um, so we hope that, um, you know, this will, you know, feature part of um, the reflections that we all need to take. Um, I say um, to China um, that, uh, you know, and, and our, you know, clear positions on this, as I just stated, uh, China has obviously uh, heard us many times. But I also say to my Chinese friends and colleagues that um, it is, you know, the, the call for China to be involved in, in those um, um, conversations is simply a, a reflection that China is now considered to be a, a world power, global power, not just from, a, a, you know, economic um, point of view, but also uh, from a military point of view. Um, so, you know, world power, um, superpower, uh, also have um, has a, a responsibility, uh, and that includes uh, those negotiations uh, and, and dialogues together with others. Um, and I hope that um, you know either um, in the in the uh, um, a context of a UN or perhaps other multilateral platforms, uh, or um, between the countries themselves. Uh, we don't know um, which uh, ways, or maybe there are some other uh, options as well. Uh, but we do hope that uh, all nuclear weapon states uh, will be able to uh, discuss um, their responsibilities for further reductions and, and also different kinds of nuclear weapons to be uh, looked at uh, in the future. And if there is anything that the UN could do um, um, to, to support them, uh, of course, we will be um, we will be uh, 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 quite keen to to do so. Uh, but in the first instance, I think um, it's those nuclear weapon states um, that are fully aware of, of of their responsibilities. I go back to the N N five or P five dialogue mechanisms. Uh, uh, that is just one example of their realization that they do have a special responsibility that they need to fulfill. And, and they are uh, continuing with that. Um, the Middle East Conference, um, uh, as you know, we had one conference, uh, but that was last year, 2019, uh, that was able to adopt a quite good political declaration, um, which uh, uh, made very clear that it is uh, um, open and inclusive uh, uh, process. Uh, it is not um, an exclusive one. Uh, only with the existing, um, you know, participating states, but it's open to all uh, uh, countries of the region. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I mean, we were supposed to have an, the second conference in, in November, obviously, um, because of the COVID, uh, it was uh, postponed um, and it will uh, take place next year. Um, we hope that, um, um, you know, uh, the current sort of uh, uh, political declaration uh, that makes it very clear um, the um, you know inc inclusive and open nature of the process uh, will be fully understood by others, and and we hope that um, um, you know perhaps uh, not immediately but uh, uh, in the future uh, there will be opportunities for others to be um, you know uh, engaged in this uh, process. Uh, of, um, you know, identifying the way forward uh, on this issue. Um, there are, um, you know, um, informal works that are, you know, continuing. Um, you know, we, we have uh, um, done together with a couple of countries, lessons learned uh, from other nuclear we weapon free zones from other parts of the world, et cetera. Uh, so they, you know, obviously this is a complicated issue uh, so there are many more things to be uh, studied and, and discussed, um, but as the UN Secretariat, uh, we, we are fully committed to supporting this process. Now, um, in the context of the MPT, um, 
we hope that now that there is a UN process, you know, this Middle East conference is now um, uh, within the UN. MPT is not a UN process. So um, there is now another platform to discuss this issue of uh, um, um, free zone uh, in, the, in the Middle East, uh, elsewhere, uh, not in the context of the MPT. Uh, so, um, if you will, that achievement that there is now a process separately from the MPT um, is a, a positive contribution in the context of the MPT um, in that they don't have to discuss this, bring this issue back uh, to the MPT. Uh, let us, um, you know, uh, support the, the process that is taking place in the UN uh, context. Uh, obviously, the, the progress of, uh, you know, from that process, uh, the UN process will be reported and, and fed back into the MPT discussions. But now, um, let, let us recognize that there is a separate process uh, going on. Uh, and that's um, all, I hope, give that process a chance uh, in the UN. It has only started um, a year ago, and there has only been one uh, conference. Um, and, and so what we need to do is to give a chance uh, to that new uh, process that is uh, still um, taking place in, uh, in the UN context. Thank you very much. A very, very last question and another small question. None of these questions have been small questions. They've been all major issues as befitting the topic. And this is from Andrew Gilmore in the IIEA, and he asks, how might placing nuclear weapons and the disarmament agenda at the intersection with climate change and public health heighten the relevance of the non-nuclear weapon states and nuclear weapon states? Thank you. That's a, a very important question. Um, I mean, first of all, um, the COVID uh, impact. Uh, I, I recently gave uh, a speech at another uh, platform on how the COVID has impacted uh, the overall, not just nuclear, but overall disarmament work. Um, and it's, um, you know, there are obviously quite a lot of impacts, um, but at the um, um, sort of high level, um, at the strategic level, um, I think there are some uh, quite important lessons that we need to apply from COVID uh, and then look at the, um, the, the interlinkages. Um, I mentioned one, I mean, seemingly, um, you know, unlikely events can actually cause this. So let's apply that to, um, to nuclear disarmament. You know, it's, it's an urgency issue. Um, but it's also, um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, really made us realize, I hope made everyone realize that Nuclear weapons alone cannot um, uh, make us safe. Um, uh, invisible virus um, has actually put the entire world into this uh, um, uh, situation. Uh, really means that we have to really rethink our approaches to security overall uh, and put uh, humans more at the center um, and, um, and renew or reinvigorate uh, our efforts to uh, reduce weaponry. Um, we also think that um, because of the fiscal uh, pressure that we will all have um, to recover from COVID, um, et cetera, um, you know, there will be um, a limited opportunity, I hope, for countries to continue with the, the current path of the unlimited military expenditure. Um, there are some experts um, you know, CIPRI, uh, for example, um, who would argue, who argued that uh, there will be a small window of opportunity um, um, because of COVID um, to, um, you know, for countries to, to really realize that uh, this is a time to actually try to secure national security through negotiation and diplomacy rather than continuing uh, to increase military budgets. Um, so there are, um, you know, many sort of entry points and, and linkages that we can we can build, uh, and I hope that this will be uh, this will become um, a, a new sort of um, a trend in our multilateral discussions as well. Uh, this was noted. I note uh, we noted this um, as uh, uh, you know as we went through the first committee this year. 
part of it was a, a virtual format, but many uh, countries, in fact, um, made a reference to this issue. Uh, so we hope that this will become uh, uh, one of the trends that we could uh, we could also uh, create, if you will, um, as um, as we um, come out of the COVID uh, crisis. Um, the same goes for um, uh, climate change. I mean, climate change and nuclear weapons are two existential threats um, that we still have, um, and. Um, as the Secretary General made his remarks, uh, policy speech um, just uh, uh, um, last week at Columbia University, um, you know, he would like to um, make sure um, that next year, to, to 2021, will be a year of a, um, a quantum leap uh, when it comes to uh, tackling uh, climate change issues. Uh, and we hope that um, uh, that will be the same uh, for nuclear disarmament because we have many opportunities, uh, as I illustrated in my remarks, uh, throughout 2021. Um, so let us use um, those opportunities um, to the, the better and, and more secure uh, world that we can, we can have. Well, thank you so much, High Representative, Under Secretary General. Um, thank you so much for your time, uh, your enthusiasm. You have a very big job um, and you do it with such energy um, and with such kindness in sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you and good luck for 2021 and the review conference. Thank you so much again uh, for this meeting. And it was really nice to see you uh, again. Uh, I hope you will all stay well um, and uh, have a nice uh, holiday season. Uh,